Okay, so um, I'll go ahead and kick you off here. Thank um, you. So everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is week two of Eating in the Kitchen. Um, and today we have uh, Corinne uh, from Norwood, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, he's going to walk us through bar designs. Bar designs. And uh, so thank you very much, Corinne. I appreciate it. Okay. Um, just so you guys know, this is my first time doing a Zoom uh, class. Uh, that sounds like Zumba. Um, so if I'm doing something wrong or you're not seeing something or you're not hearing me or whatever, um, please uh, let the folks, I guess, at Eaton know uh, so they can alert me uh, somehow. So I, I don't want to make a mistake here. Um, uh, okay, so uh, let's get started talking about bar design basics. And for some of this, this may be review or things that you already know. Um, but I like to start off with this picture of a wonderful bartender that I met uh, earlier this year. Her name is Caledonia Wright. Isn't that a beautiful name? Caledonia. Anyway, uh, Caledonia is a fantastic bartender in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, she works at a place called Open Outcry. Should you find yourself in Vancouver, please go see her at Open Outcry. She makes a hell of a drink. And she and I had a very spirited discussion about concepts of bar design. She turned me on to, again, uh, a book that I read when I was a kid called Cheaper by the Dozen. Maybe you saw the movie, maybe you read the book, um, but the, the, uh, the main uh, character in Cheaper by the Dozen, and it is a true story, is a gentleman who is a, um, a motion efficiency expert. He had worked for Ford Motor Company and many other factories on uh, efficiencies in the workplace. And if you think of a place where we need to talk about a lot of efficiencies, the bar makes sense. Anyway, Caledonia and I had a wonderful conversation. She made me this, this really kick-ass gin and tonic that um, I don't know that I could ever duplicate at home. But uh, uh, anyway, she taught me quite a bit about that. And so I'm going to be incorporating some of uh, what Cheaper by the Dozen talks about into the um, bar design classes that we do this summer. Um, as long as we're talking about that too, really quick, we have not opened up registration for these because we're still waiting to see what the heck is gonna go on uh, with all this COVID craziness. Um, but my, my uh, intention is to get registration forms out to everybody uh, by uh, maybe May 15th, something like that. Our first class is not till the end of June. So I think we'd be fine with that. So uh, uh, take a look at Caledonia and her terrific little bar here at Open Outcry. Uh, what a great girl and uh, let's get going. Okay, so you already saw this. Some of you already saw this. Who needs a drink now? Um, hey, let's be honest right now. I think we could all use one. Um, I don't know about you, but by the time I go back to drinking in bars, uh, the bartenders are gonna love me and a lot of my friends because my alcohol tolerance has definitely gone uh, substantially up since uh, I'm having a nice cocktail just about every night. Uh, and my friends from, uh, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. Sunny Philadelphia. Philadelphia. When all of this is over, we're gonna return to bars over, like gonna... uh, my friends here from um, How I Met Your Mother are, and we'll be doing exactly what you see here. We'll be discuss discussing our lives and having a few drinks and, and life will be good. Uh, so I point that out because bars are really the heart of hospitality in any um, hotel, restaurant, etc. This is where people meet up before perhaps they go to sit down. Uh, bars are absolutely the center of conviviality and socialization at any location. Um, this is a shot from a beautiful hotel in Chicago called the Albert. Uh, excuse me. The restaurant is called the Albert. The, the hotel is called Hotel EMC Squared. And this, this uh, restaurant is modeled after what the interior designer imagines um, Albert Einstein's library would have looked like had it also had a bar and restaurant inside of it. It's a pretty cool place. So why is bar design so important? You guys know this instinctively because it's all about money. As I've often said, I'm sure you guys have heard this before, there's more profit poured at the bar than cooked at the kitchen. Um, hey, I love a great steak and, and, and some sides to go with that, but I'm only gonna have one of those. Um, 
food is great for revenue for for bringing people in and having them sit there but where the profit is always made in restaurants really is at the bar it's with the two or three or five uh, glasses of wine that I'm going to have with that steak, uh, et cetera. And if you, um, so we always want to mention that so that you really think of the bar as the profit center of any facility. A uh, profitable bar is critical to any restaurant's success. Um, oh, and by the way, on the lower right-hand corner of some of my slides, I have uh, some interesting looking cocktails. And as a follow-up, I will be sending you guys uh, recipes for these. This is uh, the Dancing Leprechaun, and it's made with some Grambouille and some Irish whiskey. And it is a, a very delicious, refreshing drink on a day like today. Okay, so back to, the, back to uh, bar, bar design. A critical thing you got to know first is health codes and health codes are changing. Uh, I was just on a um, FCSI um, Zoom uh, virtual happy hour. Uh, Ken, you were there too. Um, we were talking about uh, the importance of hand sinks, whether they're decorative and they're just uh, in a place perhaps near the um, buffet or they're adding more hand sinks for restaurant workers themselves definitely know what your local hand what your local health codes are uh, hand sinks are just a small part of that um, consider your throughput goals like I said uh, even with cheaper by the dozen look at the bar as a factory um, thinking about uh, highly organized spaces ergonomics etc um, and as before even a lot of bartenders are out of work right now they're going to be going back to work and at that excellent labor will still be difficult to come by. So we want to design bars where the very best bartenders will not only want to work there, but they're going to stay working there as well. As you guys know, nobody is making money when bartenders are walking around to make one drink. Uh, nothing makes me sadder than to order a, a mildly complicated drink that's from the special menu and all of a sudden to see the bartender disappear because he has to go off and find one unusual ingredient that is not close at hand for him or her. Zero step bartending is really what you want to think of. This image is from uh, Libertine Social, which is in the Mandalay Bay Hotel in Las Vegas. Beautiful design and actually very interesting use of our Tobin Ellis cocktail station components in that he, he meaning Tony Abu Ghanim, who, um, who runs this bar, he designed it with turning that uh, liquor rack um, to just as a, at a 90 degree angle off of the uh, Tobin Ellis curved um, uh, front speed rail. Very interesting, but if you were standing there as a bartender, it's just a simple step to the side and you can grab your big uh, bottle of booze. Pretty cool. I'll have some more examples of some neat bar designs for you guys later. Uh, we always design bars from left to right and from clean to dirty. On the left, you're going to have things like your mixers, your clean glasses, your clean cocktail shakers, uh, your garnishes, etc. That ice pin has to be right in front of the bartender. Uh, we also put the soda gun on the left. Why do you think that is? 90% of the population is right-handed. And so we do not design bars for left-handed bartenders. However, I will tell you, Tobin Ellis, who actually gave me this graphic that you're looking at, he's left-handed himself. But he does not bartend left-handed, he bartends right-handed. The reason why we do this is so that the strong hand, the dominant hand, the right hand is the one that is picking up uh, perhaps from that uh, liquor step to the right, uh, a large heavy bottle of let's say Chopin uh, vodka or something fantastically delicious like that. So you're picking up that very expensive bottle with your dominant hand and you're using your weaker hand, your left hand, for the soda gun or for a mixer, et cetera. That's something that if you were to spill it, drop it, et cetera, would not be as critical of a, of a, a, a hit to the bottom line as, as dropping a bottle of booze. Uh, liquor out should always be on the speed rail in front of the bartender and to the sides, as well as that speed rack to the right, which is what we've got here in this example. We can also use a liquor step in that situation. To the right of that would be uh, your dump sink with your strainer. I'll talk a little bit more about dump sinks in a little bit. I know that that's a very exciting topic for everybody. And then to the right of that is an area where the bartender has space to set down uh, dirty glasses, et cetera. 
left to right, clean to dirty. Uh, I know this slide is kind of uh, crazy to look at, but I wanted you to get an idea of all of the items that bartenders need to have within arm's reach in order to do their job. Um, this, I like how this uh, bar was designed with the one exception, and, and some of you might uh, pick up on this, is I do not like the door swing of that unit that's just uh, kind of sort of to the um, rear and the left of the bartender. I think they got that wrong. Okay. So critical dimensions. Um, one thing I will say, you are welcome to take screenshots of anything you see here, if you, maybe you're already doing it right now. Um, but I will send you some uh, handouts that will have uh, some of these critical dimensions listed in them. So you don't have to necessarily take notes if you don't want to. The key dimension that I like to point out is the depth from the bartender's hips to the edge of the drink rail. That is a very important dimension for ergonomics. Um, if you were to try and pretend that you were a bartender and put your arms up into an ocean neutral work position, like, I don't know if, I don't know if you guys can see me or not, but uh, you definitely want to pour, no, you want to pour that, that liquor and the mixer in your left hand no more than 10 or 11 inches away from your hips. If you've got something like a double speed rail in front of the uh, bartender's hips, you're talking about moving those arms out another couple of inches, probably another four to five inches. And what happens when you have to extend your arms out and bend over at your hips, is that puts tremendous pressure on your, on your lower back. There's a, a muscle that runs all along the sides of our backbones and it's called your erector spinae muscle. Probably not pronouncing that right. But just so you know, it's that long ropey muscle and it can really set on fire if a bartender has to reach uh, more than 10 or 11 inches from their hips to pour a drink uh, uh, into, a, into a cocktail glass on the drink rail itself. Um, really, really important. Um, I, I probably overemphasize that. I don't know, maybe Tobin would, wouldn't say I overemphasized it, but having been a bartender in my life in the past, uh, I understand that uh, it's a very physical job and it can be very uncomfortable if things aren't set up appropriately. Uh, some more critical dimensions here. Um, I'm not going to go through these, um, but again, you will have these as a handout, but it's a good reference guide when you're designing a bar so that you're certain to create enough space for people to work in a comfortable manner. Begin all bar designs with that cocktail station. Um, that is basically the center of the bartender's universe where everything is around him. Um, there, that previous slide that I had, actually maybe I'll pop back and show it to you, the one with the circle. See the circle here? That is, is where the bartender can reach without actually having to move outside of that cocktail station. So you absolutely want to think about that when you're designing a bar. How far away is the bartender going to have to go to access something. Is it a garnish? Is it a mixer? Is it um, the glassware, etc.? cetera? Uh, so keeping that uh, cocktail station right where, it, keeping it, it as condensed as possible and right where everything needs to be is important. Um, oh, and another tequila sunrise, lovely looking cocktail in the lower right. Okay, um, actually I have updated this form. Um, I have a, a Excel spreadsheet that'll do the math for you. If you're working with a customer and you want to sit down and as they're talking about what their goals are, what their ideas are for their bar, um, there's some metrics that we can take that will help us determine how big to make the bar, how many cocktail stations are needed, etc. In addition to um, an Excel worksheet, I also do have uh, two pages of questions that are pretty important to have as part of a conversation when you're working first with a customer who's looking to design a new bar. Um, uh, Eaton Marketing has those available and I'm happy to send those as a follow-up as well. But just to kind of get your wheels turning on, on all of the, the factors that are needed to be uh, documented in order to figure out what kind of bar to, to design for your customer. Okay, cocktail station components. The center of it all is that ice chest that's highlighted in red. On the left is the Tobinellis cocktail station. On the right is some standard Perlick bar equipment. Um, but you can see that's still the center of the universe, basically, uh, for that bartender. Um, you want to have plenty of storage for liquor bottles, whether it is a step, a liquor step, 
um, which is we call a liquor display over there on the right, or if it's a uh, speed rack, um, which is on the Tobinellas cocktail station there on the left. And you see uh, the one, the uh, design on the right has the soda gun manifold. Definitely want to allow plenty of room for that. Uh, the design on the left includes a, a small jockey box or ice well for all of the store and pours for a lot of mixers. All right, I know you know the answer to this. What's the most exciting part of any bar design is absolutely the drain board, right? Well, it's not, but it, what I do wanna point out is don't ever design a bar with any gaps in it, meaning it's something that nothing fits in. Um, no matter what the size is, we can find a drain board that'll fit in there. If you allow, if you allow for um, extra space or gaps between equipment, that ends up becoming a repository for rags, the bartender's purse, um, coats, and just all kinds of junk, and it looks really sloppy. Um, and again, for a bartender to be really efficient, everything needs to be within arm's reach of where they're located. Even if that means a rack that goes underneath a drain board that holds things like extra paper for the POS station or check presenters or um, maybe smaller printouts of the menus, things like that. Also keep in mind too that more and more, especially now with uh, uh, all of the carry out uh, business that's happening right now is often it's the bar that's managing that carry out. So where are you putting the items that are needed for carry out? Bags, uh, menus, things like that. It's just something else to, to consider. I have added a carry out slash delivery question on the bar design questionnaire so that you're sure to address that with your customer when you're designing their bar. Because if they are planning on having the bar manage that, the, that bar does need to have some extra space for the items associated with delivery. Okay. Uh, definitely think about uh, adding drain boards to the top of refrigeration too. On the Tobin Ellis cocktail station on, on the uh, on the left there, that is the BBS 36C, and that comes standard with drain boards. It also has an option for a cutting board there as well. Um, or you can simply do something like you see on the right there. Uh, that is from a country club in um, Arizona where they hardly could stack any of their glassware, so they needed to have adequate space for all of it, and they just simply use bar mats. It's a good solution. Definitely not exciting, but definitely essential are dump sinks. This is something that I have learned tends to be overlooked most often. The unfortunate thing is that it's absolutely critical for cleanup. We, we think about the creation of a cocktail, but we also need to remember that half the bartender's job is also cleaning up after patrons, getting their drinks off the bar, uh, dumping what remains in their glasses, ice, lemons, etc., into a dump sink with a strainer. Don't ever forget a strainer. Absolutely always need one there. Um, and being able to set down the dirty glassware so that the next person that sits down has a clean area to work in and the bartender can create a cocktail there too. A dump sink is absolutely critical. Sharing dump sinks really slows down bartenders. So if you can at all avoid it, please do so. Even if you're just creating a very small dump sink. Okay, also not, ex not exciting at all, but totally essential are hand sinks. Um, hand sinks, as I mentioned before, are a huge topic right now. Um, what I'm seeing in most jurisdictions, at least in urban areas like Chicago, where I live, is the use of um, um, hand sinks with side splashes on them. That uh, image to the, on the left side there, that's from the United Club in Boston. Um, airports are real uh, sanitation centric and so having uh, side splashes is something that are is going to be required pretty often i think and actually if there's some folks from ssa on this call you already know this i don't need to tell that to you so thank you <laughs> uh, anyway moving on not so exciting but absolutely essential is planning for trash Oh, I hate it when people don't plan for trash. I am not Oscar the Grouch. Um, I actually really like our trash units there uh, simply because that space cannot be um, uh, removed or shifted over with someone doing installation 
um, oh, I'll just, you know, butt this piece of equipment up next to, up, up next to something else, and they completely forget that that space had been planned for a trash can. Also, as you can see in that middle picture, the, uh, the bar there has actually um, put something on top of this trash unit to allow for, those are absolutely uh, check presenters, and it looks like maybe some paper copies of menus, etc. Like I said before, there is never enough storage space for just about anything in a bar. And so uh, bartenders are going to be very creative and clever and find all kinds of nooks and crannies to hide, uh, to hide uh, storage for extra pieces of equipment that they need. But this is what happens when you don't plan. Um, I took these pictures. The one that really makes me the saddest is the one on the upper left. Uh, I took that photo at a really great place that I love. It's in Milwaukee. The owner of this place has a terrific wine menu and he even has some great wines on tap. And I'm really happy, of course, to tell you that it includes a Perlick DZS 60 unit. So they've got uh, four whites and four reds that are on tap um, from Free Flow Wines. And when I'm there, I usually get, there's like a nice Pinot Noir that they serve uh, from this company. But look, look what the, the bartender has to do. He or she has to lean over that garbage can to fill up my glass with a very nice uh, uh, Pinot Noir. But that just makes me so sad. Can you imagine if you had to lean over a garbage can for about 30% of your job while you're working? Uh, horrible condition. Plus, it's just so sad to see that. Um, on the lower right there, that is from a pool bar. And again, it's an outside, it's a very nice place. It's an outdoor bar. Um, but then seeing, you know, those hot garbage there sitting in the sun is kind of sad, isn't it? Okay. Uh, back bar refrigeration. I love Perlix back bar refrigeration. I hear wonderful things about this stuff. Uh, you know, the, the thing that I like best about our back bar refrigeration is it's very, very flexible. Um, we have an NSF 7 certification on all of our back bar refrigeration. That means not only can you store bottles and cans of beverages, but you can also store food. Again, think about if you're having the bar service, the main conduit for the delivery drivers as well as uh, carry out. They might need to have some extra refrigeration there for food. Um, they also, we've built these units uh, to withstand a lot of abuse that um, even the food can dish out to it. For example, what I mean by that is you could have a bowl of oranges or lemons, etc., inside these refrigerators. What that does is it can often create some acidity in the air and that can in turn damage some of the refrigeration components in other companies' um, uh, uh, refriger back bar refrigeration. Ours do not. We've got a lot of enamel coated parts on the inside of the guts of our back bar refrigeration, things that you guys don't always think about. Um, in addition, our our uh, back bar refrigerators are lined with 100% stainless steel so that they're resistant to all kinds of problems, including acid, but also rust and damage, etc. Okay, so getting back to bar design, the ideal space between a front bar and a back bar should be what? It should be 36 to 40 inches. Um, if it's any less than that, it's a very uncomfortable bar to work in, uh, especially if you've got two people that are maybe my size, uh, that would be a Polish lady, five foot eight, um, that they're definitely going to be bumping into each other if somebody's trying to scoot behind me. Um, or if it's greater than, too much greater than 40 inches, it's going to, the bartender's going to have to take a couple of steps to retrieve something out of the back bar refrigerator. And again, in the bar, time is money, and that would absolutely slow down a bartender. However, I do recognize that in some situations, you do have less than 36 inches to work with. Oh, and by the way, cucumber basil gimlet, very good. I'll get you a recipe for that. So for tight spaces, you want to look at back bar units that have either sliding doors or narrow doors. The unit on the upper left is a BBR 48 with a sliding door, and the lower right, it has uh, narrow doors. A narrow door swing is only 19 inches compared to a standard door swing of 24 inches. The only tiny little issue you may have with a narrow door unit is if you're going to be putting in uh, Coors Light or some of the other European larger kegs that they call them bubble kegs because they actually have a, 
a, a wider middle in them. Um, those can be a little tight to put into a narrow back bar unit. But other than that, a, a narrow swing a back bar door works perfectly well in any, really in any bar situation too. Okay, so let's go through a little recap of things. As I told you, cocktail station, the battle bridge, the, the bartender's cockpit, get your ice, your liquor bottle storage, as well as your mixer storage, right? Okay, add to that the dump sink with the strainer. Uh, this is a Tobinella setup, so in front of that dump sink has a cocktail shaker rinser, and then to the right of that is a variable depth dipper well for a variety of different mixology tools, your muddlers, your strainers, things like that. Look, we've planned for trash, hooray. And then to the left of that is a hand sink at the entrance to the bar, and that can be used by both bartenders and the wait staff in a facility. Again here, in this particular design, we've got the back bar units 42 inches away from the front bar for everything. Again, slightly, uh, slightly larger than what we recommend, but it's going to work just fine. Duplicate, do not mirror cocktail stations. I know that you guys have worked with some interior designers and perhaps even some architects. They love to mirror things, and I can understand that. Mirroring makes things more aesthetically pleasing because they're, they're even on both sides. It just, it's just a very pleasant way of looking at things, which is great when you're looking at something. However, if you're actually working, it absolutely does not work. Um, a bartender needs to be able to get in front of his cocktail station, no matter if it's the one on the right or the one on the left, and be able to figure out where is the dram buoy, where is the gin and where, where is the gin? Where am I storing my tonics, et cetera, and not be confused because everything has been uh, turned turned the other way around. I often compare that the if if you do have run into a situation where you're talking with interior designers and they really have this into this this need to mirror things. Um, my best suggestion to you is to have the discussion about driving. Um, here in North America, um, we're very comfortable driving, right? Sure, um, but what happens if you rent a car in Ireland or England? Is it just as easy to drive? Oh, hell no, it's not. So, it, and the same thing would happen if all of a sudden for a bartender, everything were to be flipped and going the opposite direction. Um, it's going to slow you down. And again, uh, time is money. Ergonomics equals economics in the bar. Okay, so just to recap everything, you always want to plan for the busiest rush peak volume. It's always easy to shut down one of those cocktail stations if things are slow. Um, but if you're really busy and you didn't build a bar that had enough cocktail stations, you, there's nothing you could do to really uh, compensate for that. The other thing I did wanna mention here too, uh, if you look at along the right-hand side is be sure to adhere to whatever your local health department codes are for glass washing. Some require a three or four compartment sink. We mostly see four compartment sinks in Wisconsin. I don't know if you guys ever see them by you, but, uh, or perhaps you can work with just a glass washer in that same location. And in some jurisdictions, the proximity to a back of the house wear washing area uh, definitely uh, meets code there too. So you just need to know what the local health department wants you to put in place for, uh, for glass washing. So overall, it's a pretty nice design. Um, pretty simple. Things are very, very much repeated in this scenario here. Um, one of our uh, one of our bar bar design engineers uh, designed this for someone and started with that. Uh, I don't think it was you guys, but we like to have at least a little bit more information when we're starting. But um, but we could certainly. Um, we could certainly put something together for you. And I know the folks at Eaton have uh, quite a lot of experience in building bars. So um, I show this last picture because uh, this is a friend of Tobin Ellis's and I just wanted to, you to keep in mind that these, these guys uh, consider themselves to be rather ninja-like. They're always doing something. They're very ambidextrous. Um, they're some of the most ambidextrous people I've seen along with people like who play piano, et cetera. Um, their right hands and their left hands are always busy and go, go, going. Um, so let's, uh, let's show the love for these guys with uh, a superior bar design that uh, makes everybody money and makes everyone really happy.
right? Well, hey, uh, Corinne, I really appreciate you doing this. This was fantastic. Thank you, um, guys. We have a, uh, a list of everybody that uh, participated. If you were a call-in person and I don't have your email, uh, please send me a quick note or your salesperson a quick note, and we will get the presentation uh, along with the drink recipes out to everybody um, here shortly. So, But I really appreciate everything, Corinne. It was fantastic. Okay, and, great. Uh, look forward to the next one. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thank Take you. care. Thanks. Love you.